Good evening, fellow Guyanese, and welcome to another program of Walter Rodney Groundings. I'm your host, Dion Abrams, and with me on the program this evening are Professor Clive Thomas and Brother Desmond Trotman. As usual, we'll be talking about issues relevant to the people of Guyana and possibly the world at large. Welcome to the program, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Well, it seems as though there is a uh, never-ending discourse mm. on the budget, the debates, the cuts, and so on, to the extent that even the private sector commission has gotten into the fray. Uh, how do you see, I don't know how much of the comments you would have been listening to, but how would you respond to those who seem to believe that the cuts are negative and counterproductive to the development of Guyana? Are you asking me? Well, well I, I begin yes. I think first of all, we have to acknowledge that the first part of the budget process is complete. The Parliament has approved a budget which has within it cuts, I think, amount to about $31 billion. Yeah. Um, that is now the law of the land as far as the budgetary allocation by Parliament goes. But we have in the succeeding months, and for the rest of the coming fiscal year, to see the implementation of the, of the actions that have been agreed on by the Parliament. Now that is where there are a number of difficulties to arise. One is that what the government might, might very well do is as in previous years, or rather as in last year, disregard the decision of Parliament and try to undermine the cuts by acting outside the purview of the established procedures of Parliament and to try to draw the money from their source funds and from the other sources of finance that do not require parliamentary authorization. So I think that we'll have to go through a period in which the, the parliament needs to be very vigilant that that will not happen. Then there's a second problem which will arise in that the president has announced very clearly that his priority effort is to restore the cuts that were made. So not only might they be involved in that sort of process of trying to do what they did last year to get items reinserted into the budget, but they might go on an offensive which would include legal I mean, action to make sure that those, th those things that are cut do not remain cut. But my biggest fear is that um, over this period, if there's enough confusion and if there's not enough clear political direction the opposition might build and give in to the um, governmental demand. So we have to hold the um, opposition's feet to the fire. That's the task of the general public now. If you advocate these cuts and if you made them, and if the basis on which you made them are, as you told us, that we want you to stick to your word. But my, I'm not confident that will happen over the coming year. So I would like to end on a note of cautioning Guyanese that the extent to which these cuts will remain intact will depend upon your vigilance. Yeah, Dion, um, I would want to start by saying that um, when the cuts were made and the budget was passed, uh, with the amended um, in its amended form, that it met with great approval from the uh, populace at large. In fact, I do believe that the populace had wanted to see more cuts. I think that the people were very concerned about money being given to Kaisuko. They were very concerned about um, the fund, the $100 million fund, which um, is managed by the Ministry of, of uh, Music and Sports. And um, they, wanted to see, they wanted to see that cut until, unless there, is a, there was some satisfactory explanation about how it's being handled and that as far as I'm concerned that satisfactory explanation didn't wasn't forthcoming they also uh, were very concerned that's the populace were very concerned about money being given to National Drainage and Irrigation Authority an entity that has been mismanaging funds in the worst possible way and um, so that there were some disappointment by the populace in relation to the um, amounts of cuts that were that were um, that were forthcoming. They wanted to see more cuts done, um, and they want to see. I agree with Professor Thomas that they want to see the opposition hold fast 
in relation to the cuts that are made, that have been made, to ensure that the government, in spite of um, the utterances of the president, that they are not allowed to reinstate those cuts. I believe that um, the position which we have been advocating on this um, program over time, and that is that government, that the opposition, political opposition, must be prepared to fight once it is that the matter goes to court, that the opposition must be able to fight tooth and nail in every area of um, judicial um, judicial authority to ensure that um, they, those cuts remain remain in place. Because the opposition, is, the people are convinced that the government has been mismanaging funds, has been stealing money in the war, uh, you know, in, in ways that um, that only they know how to do it. And so that they want to see that these um, things, these cuts um, are enforced. They want to see that um, accountability, they want great accountability for funds. And uh, they want to, the public has embraced a position that the political opposition has spoken about, and a position that has been advocated for us by Professor Thomas, and that is the establishment of the National Assembly um, budget, budget Office. Budget office. Okay to ensure that the kind of monitoring of these appropriations which are required should be taking place. Because um, with, without, the, the, without that uh, being in place, the kind of intensive monitoring of these appropriations will not be taking place. And the public will, be, will continue to be very disappointed in relation to what has been happening. Hello. In light of what you, you would have said, you and Professor Thomas would have said, I listened to the guys from the private sector, and I was appalled at the things that they were saying. They seem to simply be concentrating. Their focus is that the cuts are bad for the country, mm -hmm. that the cuts to the specialty hospital, to uh, the airport development project, and all these things is going to shed a bad light in the international community that uh, firms that may want to do business with Guyana may feel intimidated because of an opposition that will seem to want to, to override a contract that would have been signed with them and all these things. And I get a sense that they're totally not concerned with the issues related to these projects that the opposition would have raised. What is it about the private sector that make them so myopic and um, you know, so focused on, on having things that are not in the interest? We want a bigger airport, yes, but mm. are those the only considerations? Yeah, but you see, there are two things I, I think we need to consider here. First of all, the, the um, private sector has identified an issue which we have to accept in the opposition is a significant one. And that is all the parliament can really do, the majority parliament, is to cut. Because we have no other instruments by which we can influence the direction of the budget. We can't write another budget because we're not the elected government. And even if we did write it, we're not, we won't have the benefit of the contributions of the arms of the state that have to manage the, the, the work of the budget. And therefore, we would be lacking a very crucial and critical ingredient. So the Opposition can't write a budget, and any opposition attempt to write a budget, I think is foolhardy and a foolhardy, and I would even go for this is laughable. And but there's some inane people who are arguing that the opposition should write their own budget. I certainly will not be a part of that, because the idea of a budget to be effective has to be inclusive, has to involve all the stakeholders that have a part to play in in formulating a budget, in executing it in monitoring it and seeing it through, implementing it. And if we can't draw upon the state, the executive arm of the government, to enable us to um, do those things, then we cannot in all seriousness say that we're trying to craft an alternative budget. What we might do is craft an alternative strategy that should inform a budget, but we can't craft an alternative budget. I think that to get engaged in that exercise is, would be a laughable thing. And no, you know, if you notice around the world, no other opposition parties have ever tried to do that because they know better. Although that is a frequently called for um, activity in this country. The second thing is that we have to note, as I've made it very clear here,
the private sector commission is a collection of interests which are very narrow and are not in any way comparable to the interests of the broader Guyanese public, and particularly the working class, the poor, the unemployed, and so on, the peasants, the farmers, and all that. They, that's a special interest group. And if you look at their actions, they're always involved in the type of illegality and illicit practices that we accuse the government of. They, for example, would take people's NIS, work with the NIS, and not pay it over to the NIS. They would be involved in money laundering. They, I mean, we've estimated that about 40% of the GDP of Guyana is involved in the um, phantom economy, which I, which I term it. A term that has acquired a universal significance, both in the developing world and in the um, developed world, as signifying a, a, an underground economy that is driven by large elements of organized crime. Even the remittances that come to Guyana reflect that tendency. And yet, um, that sector wants to appear to the public as if it is, um, you know, pure and holier yeah, than that. Well, they some of the people are the major, they're the major conduits through which money laundering and financial misappropriation of the Guyanese yeah. wealth yeah. takes place. Yeah. We also know that they fund the organized crime. They fund the drug trade, they fund the phantom elements. They are all sorts of illegal activities. So we have to be very careful that we don't try to um, or seek to elevate their status to something beyond what it should be. And that I regret to say is what is happening because people sometimes lump them with civil society. Mm. I see civil society as a third sector that is neither the private sector nor the public sector because the private sector is what they are and they are not part of civil society. They have private economic interests which are driving them. And unfortunately in Ghana, the dominant private economic influences are corrupt and illicit and they are fueling and funding the driving force of this economy, which is organized crime and all the proceeds and activities that go with that. So I, I am very loath to, um, to allow them to have the, the credence in the public's mind by giving you know, great weight to what they have to say. So I would expect them to be echoes of the government. And to a large extent, that's what they've been. I think I remarked here that there was actually a letter in the papers which announced a number of persons in the private sector commission that who held con conflicting positions in the state entity to those that are state, state entities, to those that the private sector are interested in. And yet, they still pontificate as if they're independent of the state. And in fact, they were so annoyed that this letter was written, they actually wrote to the editors, I think of Kaicho News, mm -hmm. Ask him not to carry such <laughs> statements again <laughs> unless they're um, somehow contacted. They're them. contacted yeah, for right. statements before, and it's something like the government. Mm. So, even an indirect criticism, they haven't said that these persons that are indicated indirectly by the letter writer do not exist. They're not saying that when he says the persons on the, on the commission that hold private and public positions that are in conflict with each other, they don't try to deny that. They are saying that they ought to be um, told when this type of thing is going to be put out. I suppose so they could put out a covering letter denying anything like that and trying to pacify it and claim that they are there serving the public interest even though they are elected to the private sector commission. So from that point of view, I think that we have to be very, very careful. We should also remember that the um, private sector law is an elected group is elected from a, the no, commission no. from a narrow band of private firms, not the vast majority of firms in this country. A lot of it is small businesses, medium-sized businesses, which don't have anything in common with these people who run the private sector commission. So we have to be very, very careful and not seek to elevate them to a status in this country, which they do not deserve. And from that point of view, I tend to discount what they have to say because they've so far echoed what the government has been saying, and they seem to be reflexively defensive of the government. They're interested in driving the opposition to ignore all the defects of the country. They'll feel happy if we act like um, ostriches, mm. and we never point out all the weaknesses and the things that we're observing. They feel that that would be good governance, because it'd make it easy for them to thrive. And I think it, it brings us to a, a lesson which I think we should draw. 
And if you permit me to go on, right, right, right. that even in these bad times of bad governance, we have to remember that there are economic interests that benefit from bad governance, else it would not continue. Bad governance is not a thing that is bad for everybody. <laughs> it is bad for you and I, as, as critics of the government, as in the, a person looking to have an independent space to express their opinions or to influence public opinion. But for some of those marauders in the private sector commission, the, this state of affairs is exactly what they want. A government that is too weak to be able to control them. A government that permits lawlessness, which they are comfortable with. A government that creates um, minimal obstacles to their interrogation by larger and wider international forces, particularly in, as regards the sources of their wealth, their in engagement with them. Um, illegal and, and narcotics trading and all the type of thing, trading and persons, smuggling gold, money laundering, all of these things, that is what they can interested in. They uh, don't want strong governance. They want the governance. property of the state. state of course, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, but the point is, the, the thing is, why we have to, I, I don't, I mean, elevating them to some position that they're not really should be credited with is, is, is the fact is that they are on the state media, and uh, these media houses have very wide coverage. Mm, but they give they give access to special groups. Well, that, that is why they get some special access because it's they're sympathetic ninety nine point nine nine percent to the state, and they can so influence they get, public yeah, opinion. But but, but Dion, you, we don't be surprised if you hear when I tell you that the masses of people out there are not taken in by this private sector. Because I was in Albaistan um, yesterday, the day before yesterday, and a couple of persons came up to me and said that they were um, they were avid listeners to this program, and they, from time to time, have been seeing snippets of NCN carrying the private sector commission's views, and their position is that if they believe, if people believe that they're foolish enough to buy in to what is it they're saying, that they got the next thing coming. People are aware that the private sector, the so-called private sector commission, do not champion the cause of the working class. And as Professor Thomas pointed out, that there are a group of businessmen whose cause they don't champion either. There's a special elite group. In fact, during my presentation in the last budget um, in Parliament, I referred to them as a a group of persons, including drug lords, posing as businessmen. Because that is the situation. Professor Thomas is right. It's a, it's a, it's a bunch of elements who are prepared to uphold the government's positions at the expense of the nation's positions because they benefit from government's positions. And in as much as they've been given, they're being given, given a lot of time on NCN in order to propagate their support for the government. It is not working. And the, the, the fact of the matter is that they're not taking time to go on the streets and talk to people one on one because people understand very, very well what the situation is. And that is why it is, one of the reasons why it is that they have to try to negate the opposition's position in relation to the courts is because they've come to understand that the larger populace are in favor of the um, of the of the of the courts because they see it as a way of exercising control over the government's excessive behavior. So that for me, I'm not surprised by the um, so-called the positions of those this the group that calls itself the. Um, Private Sector Commission. You could remember immediately after the elections, um, the chairman of the, I think, the Ghana Manufacturers Association at a particular time said that he is not in favor of shared governance, mm -hmm. a, situ a, 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 a kind of, a, kind of uh, a situation that will have taken this country beyond where it's, it's at. He said so, and he is one of those persons, one of the leading voices in attempting to condemn the opposition's position. The opposition's position is extremely correct, and our position will continue to suffice because the man in the street 
fully understands the position, is aware of it, and is supportive of it. And the, the, the private sector commission and like bodies have got to work over time in order to change people's views. And I know that they will not succeed because people understand what is at stake and they're very supportive of the opposition's position. Yeah, but I, I hope, I hope that the opposition, when it has to deal with them, deal with them from a position of moral strength and um, political culture way in advance of what they're practicing. I don't think we can be going to them and seeming to be like trying to win them over. No. These are not groups that deserve that. We have to go to them with the authority and confidence that we represent large sections of the working people, the poor people in this country, and assert their interests. Speak to them as if we're speaking to tell them what they should be doing, and not suborning them and asking them to help us out by taking positions that we take and being happy when they seem to agree with us. But that's the sort of reaction I get from time to time when I listen to Did some you? of our political persons who encounter the private sector at these gatherings. They seem pleased that they can persuade them to the truth in the APN youth position. Now, I would not be supporting the APN youth if I did not believe that in these positions they represent the truth. So it is not surprising to me, it is surprising when they cannot see the truth. So I don't approach them as if I am asking for their guidance. I'm approaching them with the opportunity to be on the side of history, to be on the side of the poor and the powerless, and to effort to make decisions that advance the interests of working people, and not only at every time, your own special interests. Because there are other work, there are other private sectors that have done this around the region. I've come out at, in courageous defense of some of the people's issues, and that is what we want at Vibrant Town. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree with Professor Thomas on that point. You know why, Dion? Because we have to understand the role of the, the, the so-called private sector. Their role is to clearly to undermine the opposition's position. Okay. Yeah, just imagine they cuss us out. They cuss us out, and in the next breath, they request a meeting to see if it is that they could bring us around to their position. And, I mean, I have some hardline positions. In fact, I feel, I personally feel, that in this kind of situation, we really should have no time for them. Well, you shouldn't even meet with them. Yeah, we shouldn't have no time with them. But I, I don't think that that position is shared. But if it was that I was in a position of authority and could influence how it is that we deal with the private sector, I will say that in the face of, the, in the face of their cussing us out, without, um, without taking an objective um, look at this situation, that we really should not even be meeting with them to make a case um, to them. Yeah, but uh, I mean, the thing that I'm concerned about, as you said, they have not taken an object. It's not that they have not taken an objective look, because I think they quite understand when you look at the airport, for instance, and you see the cost that would be incurred in the, the development of that project. You look at the speciality hospital, which you spoke about, you look at Maria, and you, in some total, you know, you look at the expenditure and then you look at how Guyanese are going to be affected, world, yeah. uh, put in debt, and then you are not sure, for instance, with the specialty hospital, that you're going to have value for money because you're putting people who are not even in any way, just as they did with Gaisuko, yeah, having I, the I, capabilities. I, I call that opportunistic rogue investing. And this private sector seems very comfortable with it yeah. because they are a bunch of opportunists and rogues. That's opportunistic rogue investing. The Marriott has no discernible origins. In any document prepared by the PPP or prepared by the PPC administration, none of the documents, the, the, pub, the pub, poverty reduction strategy paper, the competitiveness strategy, the national development strategy, nowhere does it mention anything like Marriott. Even documents prepared as recent as July 2011 elaborating and detailing the major investments in this country to 2015. The Marriott is not mentioned. So if that investment appears in front of you, it cannot be the product of some rational, rational systematic yeah. decision. It is somebody fly by night here, brain scheme. Maybe some minister or, or whoever it is, wake up one morning and say, look, somebody told me and tell me this is a good idea. Let's go with it. That's the way in which um, decisions are made in this country opportunistically and made by rogues. We have the case of the um, 
president should give very respectful and I'm writing about it this week in the papers. When you look at the same document I referred to published in July 2011, that document specifies that the road to, to reform of the broadband of ICT is to um, begin by making sure there is access. And for access to be assured, you have to do certain legislative and institutional reforms. What they've done is to put the card before the horse. Mm -hmm. they, they begin to give away the spectrum so. without recognizing that they've done none of the things that they themselves state as a precondition for further action. That is why I call it an opportunistic rogue investment. You, you have, uh, the, and in the cases of GPL and Guy Stugo, you pour in money into corporations that are using billions and billions of dollars, not over one presidential terms, but two presidential terms, and you continue to pour it without any audit of that corporation. That has to be an opportunistic rogue investment because what you're doing is allowing the governmental authorities to hand over public funds to these corporations with no vested interest seemingly in getting them to operate efficiently, effectively, by making sure you do the systematic and correct thing, which is to order them to make sure, that are we, are we do an evaluation of them, to make sure that their programs and their plans are the ones that are consistent with national objectives and the way in which they hope to get out of the rut you're in, and have those delivered to the parliament so there can be some independent evaluation of this. I don't trust this government in anything it says it does by way of a feasibility study. And the whole point of a feasibility study in a country like this is that it should be subject to independent verification. I mean, any, if the government comes and tells me to do a feasibility study and they can't show me, I would not treat it as being what the papers has written on. The idea of a feasibility study is to allow it to be tested by other independent experts. So you give it to the opposition, you give it to your parliament, to make sure that they have people looking at it, to make sure that there's no bias in the presentation of the um, feasibility study. Because you can make anything look profitable if you're willing to manipulate the figures, and if you have a bias in your choice and selection of the data that you want to use. So this type of thing the private sector allows to continue. In no other country in the Caribbean can they get away with these things consistently. There may be one or two projects that sips too. The, um, the, the pipeline, but on a consistent role. Now we have, we have GPL, we have Gaisuko, we have the Marriott Hotel, we have the presidential giveaway. We also have the um, Amelia Falls. All these things have not been subject to sort of independent public scrutiny. That must be a condition before such large amounts of public resources are spent. I mean, the, the, the Amelia Falls is, is, is looking at spending about 30% of our total GDP. How can we have an investment like that without having the opposition and the independent experts in the country convinced that there's some systematic attempt to evaluate the relevance and significance of this project? Mm -hmm. I find it an amazing state of affairs. And the private sector, which is the one should know better because they won't spend their money like that. They won't spend a billion dollars on a hairbrain scheme because the manager wake up one night and say, a, did we do this? But they would be the mind if the government do that because they might benefit from what the government is doing. Yeah, but uh, when you say 30% of the GDP for the layman, how do you explain that? If the cost is, is going to be, and I think at the very end, about a billion US dollars. <laughs> that is what I mean. Right now, it has gone up from the original 200 million to 840 something by a, a fair estimate quoted in the press. And I'm sure by the time it's concluded, we can hear that. It's just like the skeleton thing. It started out with one figure, and we ready by 1998, and this is 2013, and we're still talking about it, giving them more money, right. approving the estimates for Ministry of Agriculture, even though that thing has failed every single year. And every single year, the minister comes and says, next year will be different. The they plan. had a turn around plan. Yeah. They asked for no evidence that they turn around, of what the turn around plan is, what was recommended, what was done, no evaluation of it done by independent experts for the parliament to be satisfied that these people are worthy of, that ministry is worthy of funds. And yet they approve it. 
So even though people are happy about some of the cuts, I'm very unhappy with because many of them don't seem to make sense. Why, why would you give the Ministry of Agriculture more room to um, do this without call? I'm not saying they shouldn't get the money, but at least do the correct thing of having some independent evaluation of the operations and plans of guys to go to make sure you're not throwing your money into a sinkhole, to make sure that thievery is not at the end of it, so that you just throw your money after, good money after bad. That is what you have to avoid. And we can't seem to convince it, and these are large, large sums. Yeah, and, and, and Dion, okay. why, 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 sorry to, you know, no problem. while it is that we, that they applaud those programs which Professor Thomas um, has just said, is like throwing good money after bad. While they applaud that, not one of them, not one of them has shed a tear for the fact that the public servants have not received a single cent in terms, and, and remember they are the engines that keep this, this, this um, government um, service functioning. And the private and sector. To a certain point. And not one of them has shed a tear for the fact that government has not seen it fit to provide that group of workers with a single cent increase. Yeah, but they would not, you see. That no, I, I know, but I'm saying that we must point this out to the public. We must point out the contradiction that where it is that they will benefit as those programs that you have talked about mm -hmm. are concerned. Not one of them, uh, even though they will benefit from the increased spending power, of the public servants, if it is that they're given increases. But the fact of the matter is that whatever increase the public servants so result will get will a drop of water in terms of what it is, you know, those programs will realize. And they're more concerned with upholding those programs rather than, you know, sparing the thought and supporting the demands of the public servants for increased But wages. Brother Trotman, too, you have to consider that they themselves are slave drivers and they themselves do not pay salaries that are, are really good to the, the workers mm -hmm. for the work that they do. Yeah. So any increase in the, the salaries of public servants, any significant increase, will also be thrown back, you know, to them. And they don't want to give increases either because they're piggybacking on the low wages that the public servants are receiving. So in every way, when you examine their attitudes, you have to understand, like Professor said, that it's a matter of guarding their own interests, you see, and they will never come out publicly and campaign for better salaries for, for public servants. But the last increases that the private sector gave was some 4% or something, when they, I, I, I'm well, not somebody sure. had an arbitration and they, they were very pleased to announce mm -hmm that they were giving 4% to the workers or some nonsense like that. Yeah, those arbitrations tend to follow. No. Um, but it's given by the public sector, the private public sector lead. Um, so that might be very well the case, but I'm not sure what you're referring to. Yeah, and, but you know, one of the things, uh, I said that there, they can be shapers of public opinion, but people on the coast who would have had access to alternative media would have a sense of where they should be and how their thought processes should be going. What about the people in the interland? I just came out from Region 8, and the Amerindians seem concerned that, you know, their roads would not be built mm -hmm. and all these things. That's how they're selling it, yeah. Yes, that because they're yeah. peddling that idea to them. So I had to explain uh, that, look, you know, these cuts are based upon the, the approach the government took in relation to lumping all of the, the yeah, things. You see, there are two sources of income for the cabal that runs the state. One is their salaries, a lot of it inflated with the allowances that they get. And the other is the income they're allowed to appropriate because of their position, the, point, yeah. the way in which they're inserted into the state. They have what is called the power of economic rent they hold the right to make decisions. They hold authority to give permissions to do this and that. They have the right to issue licenses to, to run this and that. And from that position, they're appropriating all sorts of income. They have to make decisions on who's going to win contracts. So that's where they get the kickbacks. So in, inserted into the state, 
there's the, um, the public employees that we call the state employees that you can recognize. Those with close, recon close connections to the ruling elite that insert themselves into that state, get special pay, and at the same time get special access to all the agencies of the state, and therefore are able to appropriate special wealth coming from that situation in which they are sorted. And that is the bulk of their wealth. These people can build the fancy palaces that we see, some of them with swimming pools larger than any house they ever had before they became a minister, by relying on the ministerial salary. That, that's not the source. It has to be kickbacks, it has to be all sorts of things in the alleyways and byways, which allows them to appropriate. And that's why I say that um, they have a symbiotic relationship with the, with the private sector, because they themselves do that use the authority to import and export goods, to slip in through that interstice within, this, within the trading structure, the drugs and the other illegal things that they want to do. They have large bank accounts in Ghana, in London, in New York, in Toronto, in, in Port of Spain, in Kingston, Jamaica. And it's they who were able, through that appearance of legal circulation of funds, can sort the illegal circulation of funds and to move their wealth around the country and make more money in it. So everything has a shadow to it, it has a phantom element to it. So the employees of the state also have a phantom structure which allows them to reap the benefits from the state and so do the private sector. All the things that you praise about there, tying in with the with the private sector forms, the financial forms, the, and all these things, and the movement of goods in the walls and the ports and so on. That's where they have the, uh, the ability to insert themselves to make extra income. And how often we don't see that whenever these illegal proceeds are sent out of the country, they go through some sort of business. Very often they don't name who the business person is. At least for months, you might wait for that to come to the surface. But they hear they find this and that among the logs, or the rice, or the channel, or whatever it is. That's how it works. But to answer your question directly, Dion, all of the funds that were requested for, um, reg for the re those regional administrations were approved. All of the funds that were requested for Amerindian um, hinterland development um, was, was approved. And so that for them to say that we have, um, we have stymied work in those areas is really a, not a propaganda effort. Well, that's the point that what we were concerned about, what we were particularly concerned about, was the way in which it is that the funds will be disbursed, um, the way in which they will be used um, for the projects that they were identified for. But because if it is that you take regions eight and nine, particularly, and region one, um, as examples of how it is um, funds are misused. F funds have been allocated for projects which years ago, which are up to now, have not been um, carried out. And um, when it was that we met with the, with that we, um, through the Committee of Supply this year, went through those budget allocations, one of the things that we start to find out uh, because we want we want to be able to monitor some of these these works that are that are being funded, and we ask for sp for specifics in relation to those works. Where the bridges to be built, we wanted to know the dimensions, yeah. the type of bridges, um, cost, um, where they're going to be located. Because we want to put people in all of those places to ensure that those works are to be done. And so that when it is that we raise those questions in Parliament, we raise them not because we wanted to raise questions, but we wanted to have, uh, from the minister's mouth, an explanation as to where these projects are going to be carried out. And on the basis of that, we appro approve the projects. But we now have the information, and we can say to our people in those respective regions, that look, go there and check for these works. These are the dimensions, these are where they should be located, and these are the costs, and give us a feedback. But what I'm saying, Trotty, is that the PPP is not telling the people that. Mm -hmm. they, you know, 
one man wanted to take me to show me how bad a road was mm. because he is of the impression that this road has been cut out of the budget. Mm. You understand what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, I, I get that. But what I'm saying, what, I'm, what, what is happening now is that the APNU is on a, is on a blitz, okay. an outreach blitz. Where it is, they're going to areas and they're explaining to people what is it is going to happen. But our explanation will also include the information that I just um, gave, okay. that these are the works that are supposed to be carried out. And these, you'll be surprised to know, and I think that the ministers were taken, about, taken aback when it is when we heard that a road is going to be um, rehabilitated. And we want to know what, length of, what, what is the length of the road to be rehabilitated. What's the material that you're going to be using? And all of those, those are questions which, you know, came from us. I raised some of those questions. And it's on the basis of those questions that we got some of the um, answers that I'm telling you about. And as a result of that, we felt that those sums of money should be approved. We, we, we did not stand in the way. And we're going out into those communities to let people know what was happening. Just recently, before we even went into the Committee of Supply, AP and you went on a, a blitz in Region 9, and the information which they, which they gathered was startling. Startling information on the basis of that, that a lot of the arguments that we raised in relation to Region 9 were raised in Parliament. Okay, well, I'm happy to hear that, you know, efforts are being made to reach people in these far-flung communities because the government, they have the resources, our resources, and, they, and they're, they're there the, all the yeah, time, yeah. you know, always peddling some kind of misinformation. I, I, listen, I, was, I was looking at cricket when I was coming here, before I came here, and I heard the, the NCN saying that um, they cut money from NCN, mm. and they use NCN to inform the people mm. of the good that the government is doing. <laughs> 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 Propaganda, <laughs> which is like that. It's well, amazing. I mean, we have to expect that they're going to twist the truth because they're not known to speak in the truth, and they're going to manipulate the data and information to um, to deceive, but we have to find means of countering that. I think it's a big job that we have to do. Yeah. And I'm glad to hear the outreaches that are attempting to do that. We have to look at the, where you said you raised a lot of questions about the budget in the regions and so on. They've slashed Region 4's budget, you know, the continued insertion of the REOs mm -hmm. based upon instructions from the minister. So, you know, we do the entire budget that the region would have presented so that it is not a reflection of the, the council itself, but simply uh, some kind of... Administrative decision. Right. So, but then we also have the problem, as again I'm raising these things, of this REO who continues to use the monies of the region in ways that are totally, you know, against any kind of accounting procedure, any kind of um, transparent, you know, use of the funds. The last meeting, they, we had six million odd dollars for projects that were supposed to have been done, but nobody could find the projects, <laughs> you know, and nobody knows, but monies are there to pay the people for these projects, and some would have been paid. And yet, when you make these complaints to the minister, nothing is being done. So again, I'm raising the point that why would a minister condone such things if in some way he's not colluding with the element to get some of this money that, that is being misappropriated? Dion, in this year's budget presentation, I want to tell you something, that APNU had a, an amazing team of, um, of geographic um, representatives. Um, geographic meaning that they represented um, certain regions who really were on the ball in relation to examining the ministers in, on, on, the, on the matters of the budget. Um, very, very, very intensive work um, were put in by those persons. And I want to applaud them publicly about the work that they've done. Um, one of the things that we were concerned about, and it occupied a lot of the time of um, some of the presenters was the role of the REOs. Last year, I sort of um, went to tongue on the REOs. Um, this year, um, other, sp other, other um, spokespersons took it up and ran with it because we were concerned, as you have said, 
about the fact that the in some in some regions and this is more this is more prevalent in the hinterland communities than it is on the um, in the on the coastal communities because in the hinterland communities you find take region 8 for example region 8 we understand that the councillors had no input in the preparation of the budget had no input in spite of the assurances given by the minister about to the contrary they had no input and there were letters to this um, effect that they had no input. Um, the REO, who's a person of um, that great questions have been raised about, you know, um, and we've spoken about his transgressions on this program over and over. He 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 is a, he is a liar unto himself, and several complaints have been made to the minister, without redress to the council. A motion of no confidence was moved in him, and nothing has happened. The minister pretended at the, at, during the budget um, inquiry as if it is that he had no knowledge of um, this um, thing. But it's there. The information is there. The information is there. So people are concerned. I mean, in Region 4, where there was some interface between the council and the RUs, the regional administration, about the preparation of the budget, because we understand, I understand, that there was some kind of interface between the regional councils and the regional administration. But in the final analysis, after the allocations would have been made, after the allocations would have been made, the regional administration is supposed to get back to the council, to the council and, they, and, that, and, and, and that, that collective will prioritize the works to be done based on the allocations that are made. But that is not being done. Now consider this, if that is taking place in communities on the coast, in regional administrations on the coast, what the hell is happening in relation to regions 8 and 9 and 1, where, they, where they, um, the, the power of the RU seems to be um, even greater than on the coast? But you know one of the things that I, I a point that was being made by one of the a friend of mine from Region 5. He was saying that it's only in Region 4, the regions that are controlled by the opposition, that you hear nothing about the chairman. Uh, you hear about the RU and you hear about all the other uh, agents in those councils. He said in Region 6, in Region 5, and so on, everything is about the chairman. You see, the the, the prominence is given to the council and the chairman because that chairman is a PPP person. But in the other uh, regions where they have a minority, then they simply try to stifle all the work of the council and to try to make the, the council but we've an entity. But we've discussed that before. And we've said that let's take Region 4. And I always remember working with Alan Monroe in Region 4. Regardless of what you said, he was a very proactive um, thing. He, he wasn't a person who was merely satisfied with writing letters and um, thing. he was prepared to confront the establishment in the interests of the region. And I believe that here is where the difference lies. If it is that you prepared only to write letters as a, as a, as a, as a means of getting, uh, believing that you could get things done, the government is not going to take um, you seriously. And I believe that in those regions where that are run by non-PPP um, executive bodies, that the persons who lead in the regions should be more proactive in terms of the interests of the regions. And I, that's the only way in which it is that you're going to survive. Because if you don't do that, you'll, what's going to happen, what will continue to happen, is what is already taking place. Well, I would tend to support you on that. Um, but I think the council itself is there are people on the council who are pretty determined and willing to take the kind of action that you need, but sometimes there is this element of mediation and not wanting to really rock the boat. And you know, I remember an incident when I was in Region 4, when I was a council in Region 4. I was a council for nine years, as you know. I remember a year we were concerned about, um, I was concerned about the way in which they were treating with uh, uh, an African Guyanese woman who was the um, overseer in Eccles Ramsburg. 
and we wrote to the minister, Collymore, and Collymore did all manners of tricks to ensure that that matter wasn't dealt with. And a day I waited until the re it was the regional, uh, was the RDC statutory meeting, and it so happened that it coincided with a meeting of cabinet. And I decided that I was spending that day in front of the officer of the president, protesting the treatment of that um, thing. It was during Janet Jackson's tenure as president. I had written to her, and she had never responded to my letter. Not even, she, did, she up, up the time of that protest, she hadn't even acknowledged my letter. And before my protest action was finished, she wrote a letter acknowledging my letter and, inst and, and informed me that she had instructed Collie Moore to take certain courses of action. And I think that is the way in which people got to go. You can't just sit down and wait. You could take, there could be action of one, and there could be actions of a collective. And you got to take action, or else you're not going to get any place. Last meeting, Brother Trotman, the heads, I, I interacted with some heads of departments and, you know, of the region. And they intimated to me that because we were questioning the RU, after not attending meetings for nearly a the entire year, he was at that last meeting, and I, um, we asked him some questions, and they informed me that the man was lying at every turn, and he knew that they were aware of it, but he feels that he can get away yeah. with these yeah. actions because yeah. somehow, you know, they the kind of push and, 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 you know, energies to have him not take these actions is not coming forth. You know, every time the council tries to to be harsh and to move forward in a direction that would put him in his place, there is always this this you know drawing back or pulling back by some elements. Mm -hmm. And I think he will continue that way. There there are a whole set of black tanks in the compound, and um, they want that investigated. There is some black car in the compound there that they there are concerns about. You know, because you know the monies that are being spent. People know not how they're being spent and for what reason. And so the people who are also heading the departments have concerns. And they know when this man is lying about finances because they too are being intimidated and they are not being given the, the opportunities to manage their departments in the way that they should. So uh, these things are issues that have to be dealt with in the regions that are not controlled. I mean, in the regions with the PPP, where they're controlling, they do whatever they want. Yeah, yeah. It's not that they are above board. They're, but not, they're not above board. In Region 3, we understand what is happening there, Region 5, and so on. But we have to bring this system you know, in line, just as we want to bring the, the, the executive and the, you know, the, the other the ministers and all of those in line with the nothing is wrong with the regional chairman at the end of a meeting at the end of a rdc meeting holding a press conference and identifying those issues which are of concern to yeah, the but RDC. the press should be in the, in the meeting yeah and if, but if the press is not there invite the press kwami used to carry the press whenever you wanted to make himself the, the regional chairman the regional chairman can bring the press and the rdc meetings are supposed to be open to the public and similarly, it should be open to the press. Bring the press so that the press could get a sense. The press could, be a, could, could hear for themselves the concerns that are being expressed and can report on them. But if none of that takes place, if none of that takes place, if it is that the regional chairman sits by and allows these things to go on day after day and does nothing in terms of advancing to the public what the concerns are, yeah, what's going to happen? Yeah, people get the impression yeah. that everything is honky dory. But there's an aspect to this um, matter which I have never really commented on publicly. But I think it's perhaps worth stating now. When I first came back to this region after studying in Britain, the view held by most political theorists of the region, particularly the progressives, was that the countries of the region were too small to carry a layer of central government and a layer of local government. And there was actually a movement to abolish local government. That was a position taken by progressives. 
And I suspect in the early days with the Chetty Jagos and them, that maybe was their whole view of um, what local government was. The, the local government is what the central government wants to do locally. And you don't have to impose another layer because the country is so small, you don't need to have a local government interposing between the people and the central government because the people can go directly to the central government. They used to even give examples of how bad this was because they would say, for example, when the local cabinet records in Trinidad, there are many times when the cabinet would spend two or three hours discussing how to dispose of a dead cow or dead dog <laughs> in Sipuria <laughs> to show you how inefficient local government had become. Yeah. So I think there's a true over that attitude that local government is not a dissolving element of genuine democracy in small states. And that um, it is only because we have a hinterland that separates itself from the coast and makes that a sharp division that needs to incorporate the hinterland into what is happening on the coast, where all the administration is, is located, that maybe there is more sympathy for local government. And I think that weakness or that belief, which I think is a weakness, still continues to um, perpetuate itself. There's still the view by those regional executive officers that this thing should be handled by the state. They are extensions of the legitimate arm of efficiency. And these local government people, we, we recognize them, we tolerate them. But they're really impediments to growth. Yeah, yeah. They don't bring any local input into the process. Yeah. They are costly impediments to the smooth functioning of the central government. And I think we need to, to take that perspective into account in trying to develop a strategy for dealing with local government. And part of that is to convince people that even in very small economies, the attempt to go local is not an attempt based only on efficiency, but an attempt based on the drive for inclusivity and participation and development from below. So you tap as many grassroots opportunities as you can. But I, there's still that, I think, executive dominated view that local government, some of the other, not efficient. And the local people can't make rational decisions because they're not educated but, enough. But, but I don't think the PPP, they are, themselves are educated enough to, um, to be forwarding that view, Professor. <laughs> no, I, I think they're uneducated <laughs> enough to do it. The thing because is, with, <laughs> no, they're, they're just an instinctual reaction. I don't know to what extent it still remains with them. But that, that's a view that we have to fight against. I mean, it's only the younger generation by that time of political theorists in the region that were arguing for reintroduction of local government. But, but when I came here as a graduate from LSE, the, the motion, the movement of the region was to abolish local government as an impediment. Okay. And throughout this region, almost most of the states abolished it. I, I would understand if you would have said a, a Dr. Jagon or possibly a Teixeira, or, but they, those other elements are not of that kind of thinking. I don't believe that they would get anywhere near that level of they might be reasoning. Maybe, they might be mimicking. You know, to they consider that. They're, for me, mm. their entire objective is to erode uh, any gains that would be made yeah, by, the opposition. by the opposition. And they, 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 they demonstrate that. You yeah, know? yeah, but I'm trying to link it to that other dimension which I've never really articulated in Guyana mm -hmm. since I've been here. It's the first time I've publicly stated or even written about it. But I've always felt it there in the back of my mind and uh, we how hard we had to fight to restore the legitimacy of local government and local democracy into the affairs of the Caribbean. Yeah, I mean they publicly stated, you know, um the thing is if you have projects to do, they don't want it to seem to be coming from the local government, so they don't want opposition elements going out there to monitor the project, so it appears that... Because they're nuisance. Right. Look, you go to set up the tower in Pleasant, well, that's it. people object, you know? calling all sorts of local authority that... And there's a ground right in, in, the, in the adjoining village, which yeah, they're not even talking about. They're talking about going But to that's not the point. To them, yeah. that's a nuisance. Nuisance. Yeah. Well, see. Yeah. It's, it impedes the flow of executive mm. authority, and, or what I would call executive lawlessness. And once it's an impediment to that, then they, they find it something they have to deal with yeah, reluctantly. Rank I pass, and I'm mm. happy that the people would have stood up yeah, to I'm ensure that, you know, and that they are continuing to stand up. 
to ensure that the you know these kinds of attitudes are not continued to that 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 kind of attitude needs to be broadened mm -hmm. because I think it's the only thing that the PPP is going to understand. You know that they, that 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 force of resistance, which was which was has been demonstrated in Pleasance and in a few other communities, Kokwani, um, Bartika, is really should not become the norm um, because it's the only way in which it is that you're going to bring the government to heal, and that's what you have to do. You got to be able to bring them to heal. Anyway, and based upon all the things that we have discussed, time is on us. What would be your closing comments to the people out there in relation to the budget and the private sector? But I don't even want to go back to them. But generally, what is the way forward for the people? Do well, well, I think that um, the way forward is to remember why we are in this position, and that is that we got together to, with the other parties in the APNU to promote a government of national unity to pull shared governance. And I just like to report that this idea is not dormant. And in fact that the WP intends to has proposed that the that a conference be held by the APNU, probably around Independence Day, or if not by the APNU, by the WP, maybe at the time of Walter Rodney's assassination, mm -hmm. um, anniversary, thirteenth of June, to maybe um celebrate that concept again, once again and raise it to the primacy of our levels of discussion. So I would just take the opportunity of giving some public notice to that intention. Brother Trotman. Yeah, I would like to um, identify with that statement made by uh, Professor. I think it's important that, for we, that we put um, this thing very clearly on the front burn again. Um, for us, it has never fallen off the front burn, but perhaps we need to really um, work assiduously to make it a um, reality. And, um, the time that we propose was really um, a first step in the process of continuing our agitation. Okay, gentlemen, I want to thank you once again for being on Walter Rodney Groundings and being so lucid in your uh, pronouncements and your explanations so that people can really understand what the dynamics are and where their own positions are in relation to the actions of the government, the private sector, and all those detractors who seem to believe that the acts of the opposition are not in the best interest of the country. Those are in the best interest of the people. And if the cuts are in the interest of the people, then they're in the interest of Guyana and all Guyanese. Thank you very much for being here, and I look forward to having you with me on the program once again on this same channel next week. To the people out there, thanks for watching. Do have a good evening. Good evening.